Struggling to connect with buyers in an overcrowded, noisy sales landscape? Today's buyers want more than a spray and pray email blast. Launch a podcast and collaborate on content with people that matter most in your industry. Learn more at salesculture.work. The thing is, like, we're positive, right? Right. The issue with being positive, I would rather be in a state of appreciation than positive because I could find appreciation even when things aren't good. Right? You always hear this. I have, but you know what? I know we're, I know we're in a bad state, but hey, at least we got each other. Like, you know, appreciation is something we could find in the moments that are, there's nothing positive to be found. So that was a quick clip from Dr. Chris Zeno. Man, this is just one of my favorite episodes. So I had to, you know, recall it, do like a rewind and uh, republish it back on the uh, Joe Lemon Experience podcast. Welcome for tuning in. The music you heard behind it as well was from Daily Every Day. Not sure if you guys are familiar with Daily, but he's this young rapper out of Phoenix, and he put out a brand new track every day. So, I mean, literally, he's he's, he's breaking molds and and really pushing hard and, and challenging how we uh, even consume hip hop, man. But so big ups to Daily. So I had to put some of his music on the episode. But this episode is with Dr. Chris Zeno, and Dr. Chris Zeno is an elite trainer, former Mister America, uh, is a cancer survivor, and this, that whole conversation. You know, really, really uh, is inspirational that we had because it's about how we can transform our, you know, our actual thoughts, which our thoughts are things really. Right. And how you can overcome a lot of false hope. And it's really this process of building momentum, even like when you're scared. Right. Like this process of keep going even when you're scared. But it's that step by step of believing. And we kind of have this, you know, detailed account of how he went from this peak of his life and was went through extreme valley, and now he's pumping his way out, and uh, he's up to some major things. He's a he has one of the busiest chiropractic clinics out of Texas, um, right there in the whole uh, Houston area, I believe, Woodlands uh, suburb. And he's an international speaker as well as uh, he's the founder of the I Am Hero Project. So, man, this is gonna be this is gonna be heavy for you guys. It's gonna be a lot. I've, I've, I found this to be one of the best conversations I had uh, last year. So sit back and enjoy it. And um, let me know your thoughts. Please rate it and subscribe it wherever you are listening to this podcast. And um, always hit me up on uh, Twitter or Instagram at Joe Alex Lemon. And let me know what your thoughts are with this conversation from Dr. Chris Zeno. I know you guys will get a lot from it. If anything, you guys will at least get a kick in the butt to take some uh, extreme ownership around your own life and just, you know, dealing with those unknowns that that everyone goes through. And just, you know, those are the, the, you know, all those experiences that we all that we all deal with at times. That's those are the best teachers in life. So uh, sit back and hear how Dr. Chris dealt with his. his I have Dr. Chris Zeno in the house, man. Dr. Chris, welcome to the Real Value Exchange podcast. Thank you so much. and Everybody watching. Thank you for being on. We're going to have a great time. Man, you know what? I have to say, um, I, as I was telling you, as we just were just chopping it up before we started press and play or record, I should say, um, I really love what you're up to. I think it's, I think it's needed for the marketplace. I think it's needed for people just to be better. Um, I think more people need to have this type of conversation. Uh, I, I like your actual podcast and your actual Facebook lives. I try to jump on when I can. Uh, it was like. 15 minutes of fuel or five minutes of fuel, right? Mm-hmm. That you do. I mean, I mean, but, but you're just pouring out inspiration, but you back it up with your own work and you have an, an amazing story that you, where you overcame. Do you mind just, um, just, let's just start from the beginning, man. I want to start back where you're from because you were former Mr. America, right? Yeah. Yep. Oh, Got man. it all. We'll, we'll do that whole thing. So I yeah, want multiple, it's like multiple universes in my life. So sure. I, I usually like to always start back to 1998. So that's the kind of, uh, so in 1998, I was 21. I won Mr. America. So I was in, I was in Orlando, Florida at the time, right? Mm-hmm. So looked a certain way, felt a certain way. I had this title. I had my degree in exercise physiology. So that year, 21 was a big year for me because I graduated. I won Mr. America. Um, you know, my dad passed away. So it was just one mm-hmm. of those years, but uh, it was golden. It was golden uh, as far as um, as a trainer with a degree and a Mr. America title and doing. Uh, you know, magazine covers in Orlando, Florida. Uh, the show Xena. Remember? Uh, do you remember Xena Warrior? Xena X Warrior, man. Come yeah, man. Now, right? you, exactly, man. Yeah, yeah. You know what? So that used to come on Fox late night. Yes, if, if I remember. I, I, well, during my age, because back in the day, it was like one of those. You know, it, it was one of the first like He Man type Warrior shows. I remember, right? Right. So yeah. you nailed it. You nailed it. <laughs> Meaning that that was the first show yeah. where the actors had to have that gladiator esque look. Yes. 
right? And so, you know, the 300, the movie came out and they heard about the 300 workout, but way before that. Copycats. Yeah, they needed <laughs> to have that. The women and the guys need to have that gladiator look. So yeah. I was the trainer uh, on the set at Universal Studios Florida wow. for the for the – um, the actors, but most of the acting was filmed in New Zealand, so they would do a lot of B-roll and stuff in, in Florida. How old were you at the time? 21. So you were 21? 21, 122. In uh, college at the time, or you already graduated? Well, I graduated 21 with okay. a degree in exercise physiology. Yep. So just graduated, I guess. You. I, titles. I had a, a really good resume coming yeah. into these things, and I trained a lot of the Orlando Magic privately. You know, This is when Shaquille was there. It was just a fun time. Wow, it was man. Great. Penny and all those guys? Oh, yeah. It was the, yeah. the team. Yeah, the I'm team serious was there. down there. Yeah. So we had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And... So everything's going well. And it was in my life. It was one of those things where you, you hit a point in your life. You're like, all I need to do is just sustain this. Yeah. And I'll be great. Uh, then fast forward to uh, 26 years old. I met my wife, Whitney. We get married. And then six months into our marriage, uh, I just started going to the bathroom a lot. So I thought it was like a stomach bug or something. Because in my 20s, any ailment I ever had, it would just kind of just go away. Mm -hmm. And it got worse and worse and worse. And then I'm just not saying anything because I don't want to get her worried. Then I start bleeding every time I go to the bathroom. This is six months into the marriage? Yeah, six months. Wow, man. We're, we're newlyweds. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, that, I, I appreciate you said that because, yeah. like, if you're listening, I want you to, like, put yourself, if you're married, like, this is your honeymoon. Mm -hmm. Like, you're, this is the, the knight in shining armor I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But I'm not saying anything. And then I'm bleeding 10, 15 times a day every time I go to the bathroom. Then I go on the Internet and I play Google MD like a lot of people do, right? You got an ailment, you type it in, and the first thing that pops up, blood and stool, is cancer. You know, I lost my dad from that. I lost my grandfather from that. And at that time, my idea of health, the, the, the philosophy I was raised in health, was health was just kind of how I look or how I felt. So if I looked good and felt good, I was healthy. Uh, I also had believed at the time that health was genetic, right? So cancer was genetic. Heart disease was genetic. So if it was in the cards, mm -hmm. nothing I could really do about it epigenetically. And so I just kind of hit the delete button, just got out of there. I was like, oh, my God, I'm 26 years old. It cannot be happening this soon. And I just hit it. And then this got worse and worse. And my life started becoming like a, imprisoned with this, this experience or this condition I'm having. So if I had to go you know, meet you right now, I would go in the building. Where's the bathrooms, right? Because you always had this urge to go to the bathroom really bad. Yeah. And it was started controlling my life where I would stop eating eight hours before I had to be somewhere. So things would go through me. How long were you kind of going through that process, I guess? Because that's a two and a half months. OK, yeah. I mean, I mean man, you know, I, I just want to I just want to sit right in it for a second, because, you know, when you, whenever you're newly married, I've been married for a while now. And it's it's like you do come out. You want to be the hero because you're like, all right, I'm going to take this. I'm going to take my bride. I'm going to take my wife. I'm going to run this household. I mean, that's how most guys kind of come yeah. out with it. Right. And you want to kind of lead the way. And um, I had a rough first year. A lot of people have rough, rough first years I, I've, I've learned down the road. But that's a, that's a hit, man. Oh, it's a, ma it's a yeah. massive hit, yeah. especially when you're hiding it. Mm. Right? Because you're like, because part of me doesn't want to deal with it because mm -hmm. I don't want to know what it could be because I had an idea what it could have been. Mm -hmm. And then I don't want to get my wife worried. And I'm thinking maybe it'll go away. And it didn't. And I'll just tell you the day she found out, I went to a TJ Maxx. It was on a Sunday. And I went to, and did my routine. I walked into the store. I walked all the way in the back where the bathrooms are. They're always in the corner somewhere. And they were locked. They were under construction. And I told the guy, I'm like, dude, where's, where's the bathroom? He's like, oh, they're just under construction. Just go out to Sports Authority. It's next door. And as I'm trying to get out of that place, and you know, now, now it's a mental thing. Like, oh, my God, there's no bathroom. And then the anxiety was so bad, like in front of like 40, 50 people, I lost my bowels in public. Wow. And that was the first of many. I mean, we could, I could tell you, because once that happened the first time, then it's just like, you know, your, your mind wasn't strong anymore. But I remember standing there when it happened the first time. Now, number one, it was just degrading and embarrassing. And I knew those 40 people, like, none of those people ever seen anything like that. Sure. Like, don't think, like, I, I don't think anybody has ever seen someone lose their bowels besides a baby. And, but it wasn't like you could hide it. I mean, when, when it's blood and mucus, that shows through. So people, they don't know what's going on. So they, I'm sure they feel empathy, and I'm sure they feel bad, but I think they're also horrified. So I ran out of that, uh, that building to a loading dock and called my wife. She picked me up with towels over the front seat. And we went to the hospital. They knocked me out. They did a colonoscopy. And when I woke up, the doctor's like, I know exactly what you have. He goes, you have an incurable terminal disease called ulcerative colitis. It's autoimmune. Because your immune system is literally eating yourself from the inside out. Mm -hmm. uh, let's start you on high doses of a drug called prednisone, which is pure stress hormone to lower your immune system. And then I was on Xanax and Valium and got addicted, like uh, chemically addicted to that. 
So I had an, uh, an issue there. They gave me another drug that it was so hard on your liver, it gave me medically induced hepatitis. So I'm being treated for hepatitis, this ulcerative colitis. And then I wind up going to Dallas, Texas for the top four doctors in the world. And they, I was on a, a low-dose chemotherapy, wow. uh, interferon for the, ulcer, uh, for the hepatitis. Then I was on three organ rejection medications. So if you're listening, God forbid you ever had an organ transplant. As soon as I, someone else's organ goes in your body, your body will reject it immediately. Yes. So this organ rejection medication, it lowers your immune system at the DNA level. So you just it can't fight it. It, it's, it. It still rejects it, but over five to ten years. And so now I'm wearing a mask everywhere I go, and it was just getting worse and worse. And I went from 230. So right now you're looking at me about 215. Yep. Um, from about two, yeah, 230 pounds mm-hmm. all the way down to 158 pounds in about Holy. four months. Yikes. And which is really important. Let, let's kind of go back to what you mentioned that when you got married, you wanted to be these things mm-hmm. to someone. And it, it's almost like the bodybuilding, the Mr. America, the trainer for the movie stars, the covers in the magazines. My entire identity now, in my because it was my early 20s, understand that I started working out at 13. So literally for 13 years of my life, my popularity uh, with, my, with men and women, whatever that might be, was always – from a physical standpoint, yeah, right? Yeah. So my entire identity was ripped, like Man, literally ripped from me. I can relate with that so much. My mom bought me my first 300-pound weight set, threw it in the basement when I was 13 years old because I was like, Mom, I've got to work out, i got to work out. I was chubby. Yeah. And then uh, all summer I just started hitting it. And I never stopped working out since, right? right? I mean, because once you get behind the bench, and I mean, I, I had some ugly moments where the bell got trapped on me in the basement. And you had to roll it down somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, but man, I tell you though, man, when you get into it at that young of an age, uh-huh. it's who you are. Because man, um, especially pre high school mo- movement, if you got right in like the early high school days, yep. it's around that time frame. If 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 we're like if we are tracking right there, then that's who you were through high school. Who you were through college, right? Because that's who I was in college as well. If you're Mr. America, I'm sure it's the yep. same thing. So this is all you know for 10 years straight. That's over half your year, half time you've been alive. My entire lens of life yeah. was through a fitness and how I looked. Yeah. It was my identity, man. People knew me for that. And, and it's, that was it. So imagine having it absolutely ripped away. Okay. And uh, they're like, listen, nothing's working. You lost all this weight. I mean, you're down to 158. We got to go in now, and we got to do surgery. So they set me up for surgery in a week and a half. They're like, "This is the surgery," and these are these are awesome docs. They're like, "Listen, um, we're going to take out your colon, mm. so you're going to have a hole out of the right side of your uh, out of your abdomen for the rest of your life. You'll, mm. you'll have a colostomy bag. It's just a bag that collects a bunch of waste. Yep. You'll have it for the rest of your life. This thing's going to break. It's going to leak. It's going to get infected. Twenty seven years old right now, or something like that. Yeah, just almost right. Uh, they said, "Listen, you'll be on five thousand dollars worth of medication for the rest of your life. Multiple surgeries. Uh, you're sterile." I'm like, okay, well, can I donate sperm or something? Like, no, you're sterile. The drugs already made you sterile that we put you on, so there's no hope of that. And um, that's all we could do. But, like, we are concerned because you're on all these organ rejection medications that we thought would work. It's it's almost going to be impossible that when we remove your colon that there's going to not be some type of uh, localized infection somewhere, mm-hmm. right? Meaning that I'm immunosuppressed and there's going to be some type of bowel infection. So I said, wow. So that meant ICU. That might, who knew, you know, you just, it was just not a good road. Sure. Um, so I'm like, all right. And because I was definitely a person that wanted to know that I did everything. So if you told me how to do this drug or that drug, it's just so I know I did my part because I never been the one that says I was the one who failed at that. Right. So I'm like, all right, I just got to do what I got to do. So there's, you know, a week and a half, you know, going to have the surgery. So I fly home to see my mom. And now the thing is your health affects just, not only yourself, but all the people around you. So, of course, man. You know, now I have a mom who lost my dad when I was 21. She lost two sons already. One died from a, a freak accident. One died of a heroin overdose that she found, man. It wow, was nasty. Man. Mother's intuition. She literally f- had no idea but had this bad feeling. Drove around neighborhoods and found him. Dude, it's a miracle story. Anyway, she finds my brother. So uh, two sons that died. Husband died. How many sons in, in all? All. Um, yeah. she, uh, four. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I had some half brothers. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so this is what my mom's going through. Wow, so man. she sends out the prayer email like any other mom does. Mm-hmm. Everybody's praying that the surgery goes well. And then one person, my anatomy teacher from high school, my tenth grade anatomy teacher, goes, "Hey, make, I'm going to see Chris when he comes into town." So I come into town, and I'm there. And there's my anatomy teacher. And if you guys are listening, I want you to pay very close attention to sometimes when you're going through a tough time in life, whether it be relationship, business, finances, or health. 
always pay attention to the people, the movies, the songs, the book. Like, there may be one thing that's said or seen in that moment that could absolutely change your perception and literally change the course of your life. Sure. And so, some my anatomy teacher, I'm like, hey, what are you doing here? He's like, listen, I need you to go see my doctor. He's a corrector care chiropractor. And when he told me that, that was an insult to me, right? Because <laughs> yeah. I was like, because my, yeah. um, my, any type of experience with chiropractic was someone who taped my, when I play baseball and footballs, they mm-hmm. tape my ankles, stretch out my hamstrings. So I was like, how's a muscle modality or massage going to help a, a incurable disease of organs? And you already saw the top guys out of Dallas, right? You said, yeah. Best top, four, uh, the yeah. billion dollar facility. Come on. Sure. $250,000 in medical debt. And, my, and then I said, listen, I appreciate you because you, 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 you ever, just imagine that, right? When someone you deal, we've all been there, we're dealing with someone and someone kind of gives you, uh, hey, you know, try this. And you're like, oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. It was one of those things. Thanks for the magic berries. And yeah. The th- yeah. Thanks for my, your, your rainforest drink, <laughs> sure. you know? And, and I said, listen, I appreciate you, man. But I go, I, I tried everything. I tried it all. And this is what he said. He goes, well, you didn't try it all. He goes, because if you tried it all, you would have had your health. Hmm. And I was like, damn. And in that moment, what I didn't realize is when it comes to becoming a victim Mm -hmm. or when it comes to losing hope, Mm -hmm. you never know what's happening to you. It's so subtle, just like a disease, because you get to the point where you really believe I tried everything or I'm a victim or this is the cards I've been given. And you don't know how you get there, but you believe that. So true. And I said, and he kind of, he kind of woke me up out of that. I'm like, he's right. He's right. So. Wow. And so I went to see this doctor. Uh, at a, he had an office in his home. Like, so, you know, you're going in there going, cheese. And he taught me just how the body was created to heal and function. I got that right. I, you know, I had my degree in exercise phys. Uh, he taught me about the spine. Got it. But I never knew I could do anything about it. So I, then when I went back to look at my x-rays in my spine, I saw a blind spot. So a lot of times in life, that's the thing. We think we tried it all, but there could be blind spots we don't know about. Yes. And that's where we get hung up and so I saw damage on my lower spine and those nerve roots go to my colon area I had 50% pressure on my brain stem that works with the immune system and that was that was the blind spot I didn't know I had I didn't have pain because then see I, I thought health was how I look or I feel so I didn't realize you could have damage and not feel it just like cancer and heart disease you don't feel it till it's too late and then again here's here comes the thing I said listen I just want to know one thing when am I going to get better that's all. Because when you're, whether it be, again, finances, really anything, when you're in a situation, you want to know one thing, when's this going to be over? Mm-hmm. And his answer was the reason why I went that right. He goes, listen, as long as you have that damage or those blind spots there, those problems, your body is incapable of healing itself or being in its natural state of well-being. He goes, and then what, he, what I loved about it, no matter how um, victim I was, no matter how um, whiny and, and sad and, the, and woe is me I was, he never... He always put it back on me. Mm-hmm. He goes, listen, he goes, when you choose, and he would point out, he goes, when you choose to correct your problem that you have that's affecting your life and your family, and then your body can now function and heal the way it was created to in its natural state, then your body will be able to heal and get well. He's like, but the day and the hour you're asking me, he's like, that's not up to me because that's between you, your body, and God. He's like, but I will tell you, you will get well if you don't quit on yourself no matter how long it takes. And man, no matter what I was whining about, he took that whole load and threw it right on me. Be like, listen, this is your life and this is your choice and it's going to take your work. Basically, right? It was just so powerful. Man, you were, you were 27, at, 27 right? right? Yeah, yeah. At a time, you've been in the gym your whole life. You're, you're down to 150 pounds, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. you're lost by 80 pounds or so on yeah. your frame. And this guy's telling you to pick up more weight and carry your own stuff. Basically, yeah, <laughs> right, ba- right. yeah. Basically, like, yeah. listen, I know you feel the world's against you, yeah, but you know, because I felt like you're just another false hope to me. Because everybody's like, when well, we do this drug or switch that drug or do this procedure, that. So I was just given a bunch of false hope. So what? I basically. So how are you going to be any different? Was there anything from how you were how you used to train back in the day that allowed you to push through that moment? Because man, that's a. Mm. That, that's a burden, man. I mean, a lot of times, I mean, I was just telling you this morning, I went out for uh, running for like five miles because I'm not a runner. And I'm yep. like, I want to just train my mind just to mm-hmm. do shit that I'm just like, you know, not used to doing. Yep. And it's more about mental training. It's even more about physical for me right now. But was there anything that you said, I, I'm going to carry this over from what I used to do when I was 12, 13, yep. 15, whatever, to where I am today? Was there, is there anything there? I wasn't, you know, I'm not I, sure. I mean, I, I wish I could tell you mm-hmm. that I had like this drive, but I was so scared and I was so beat that's down. That's honest, yep. That... 
I wish I could tell anybody I was positive and I appreciated, but I was just, I was just done, man. Mm -hmm. And I said, and, and, uh, I said, you know, he's right. You know, I, I, but the fact that he told me, you know, you will get well if you don't quit on yourself, no matter how long it takes. So, but then I'm still scared because I, I, I'm like, okay, uh, well, you know, when you're in fear and you have all this debt going on, this medical debt and you don't know what you need to do. And then my wife comes in and says, listen, here's the deal. You do that surgery. She's like, you're not going to make it. Hmm. Uh, two, you know, you do that surgery, you go that option. You know, we're not going to have kids and we always want a family three. You'll never get out. We'll never be under the, the burden and the weight of medical debt because we, we don't even know how to pay this debt now. And she's like, I need you here as long as possible. So I'm like, all right. So a lot of times, even when you don't have the money, and we know this, when you don't have the money, even in the bank account, if you want something, you always find it. Mm -hmm. You become resourceful. You find the time, you find the money. So we just got a credit card. We put it on there. And um, I started caring. I wish I could tell you correcting the problem. And a week later, no, man, it's tough. Because how about this? Imagine that you have a problem, and you're now working on the solution to that problem. And again, it could be in your relationship, your finances, your business, your health. And you still see on a daily basis the manifestation of what you don't want anymore. 100%. Like I'm seeing blood every single day. And I'm like, man, you know, like I am seeing the real life manifestation of what I don't want, but I'm trying, but I'm correcting the problem. But, it, you know, it's not matching up, right? Mm -hmm. We don't, you know, it takes time to reverse that. And then uh, three months, three months, I was off half the meds. Awesome. At five months, I'm off all the meds, bleeding a little bit. Wow. Bleeding a little bit. But, but see, I started getting momentum. See, all you have to do, I'm not telling you guys like, until it's perfect, it's like until you start, until you, not you, because your family and friends will see it first, but until you could say, I see momentum. Oh, okay, now I know. Okay, now I'm off all the meds. Now the blood stopped a little bit. When you start, as soon as you get a little momentum, then it's all over. It's right? Then out. you got it. Yeah, then, then, you, then you know it's working. You're going the right direction. And I think, you know why? Because you realize in the moment you didn't make the wrong decision. Because hmm. in that moment, it's a pivotal point. I was scared. I had two options. And a lot of times the toughest thing in life is to make a decision. Right. Right? We don't move because we're afraid we're going to make the wrong decision. Right. And that paralyzes you. And so I started seeing the results. And at seven months, now seven months into that, my body, uh, no blood, no nothing. My body healed itself from an incurable terminal disease called ulcerative colitis. That's bananas, man. That is a phenomenal story. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the part that when I first heard it on somebody else's podcast, I want to say it was Build Your Own Network podcast. You were talking to Travis, I believe, yep. out here in Vegas as well. And, man, uh, it was one of those th stories I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't fast forward past this because this is, to me, what life is about. Yeah. I mean, now, that was very extreme. Sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Most people don't deal with beating cancer. Most people don't have those type of incidents yeah. and you know, the medical debt that comes with it. A lot. I mean, that happens a lot, but it doesn't happen to the majority of us. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that was one of those cases that's rare, but man, you can relate that to so many other aspects. You know, yeah. as people are trying to build a business, they have all this debt. They, are, they aren't seeing the actual wins yet. People are trying to build these, uh, all, all these massive followings online. You have 100 people now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. how do you get to 1,000, right? I, I mean, it's not nearly as severe, but mm -hmm. the mindset of being scared but keep going is phenomenal to me. Yeah, it's, and that's when I tell my story. I try to always distill, uh, because a lot of people, a lot of you're right. A lot of people say, "Well, I'm, I'm, I appreciate I didn't have his story," mm -hmm. but the thing is, and we'll find out later on. You don't understand. Looking back at that story, it was the most, it was the greatest teacher and blessing of my life, and I would not uh, trade anything to not have that experience, mm -hmm. and. It was a rough experience. I think it fast-forwarded me in life and got me ready for a bunch of things that I, I never planned. So it's these unknowns. You know, it's these unknowns in life, meaning that when it comes to an unknown, a lot of us are afraid to make risk, right? We're afraid of risk. We're afraid of uncertainty. We're afraid of the unknowns. And what if I told you that all, all the life, um, everything you want in life is in the unknowns because we live in Groundhog Day. So we're so – because this, society is, treat, uh, has taught us to be uh, certain. First grade, second grade, third grade, fourth, right? Okay, I know where I'm going next. And then after high school, okay, we got to go to college. And then oh, we got to get a relationship. And then we got to have kids. So we're always doing things to fit the, the, the mold so we have certainty. But realizing that in, in the unknown, when an unknown hits your life, even in, even in the micro moment, it, looks, it might look horrible. Mm -hmm. But in the macro, looking out, you'll see because of that unknown or because of that experience, it created, it created contrast in my life that led me on a journey, an experience, and was a teacher that I never – ever could have got anywhere else. And looking back, it, it allowed you to reach a point of your life mm -hmm. or have blessings in your life 
or reach a goal in your life that you never dreamed possible. So look at this. So I, I, I go through this and I get my health back and then then I'm like, I'm going to school to become a chiropractor. Yeah, yeah. Never in a million years, ever, right? If you told me, would you? See, that's the thing. We plan stuff. In nothing, if I'm looking back, nothing really ever went as I planned. That's you know, but when I do look back, I get to see all the beautiful unfolding of a life and destiny that was far greater than I could ever experience or want. Mm-hmm. You know, T.D. Jake said it best. Um, he says, you know what? Everybody wants this or that. He goes, but if you just could feel the weight of the keys of this church, <laughs> it would cripple, it cripple you. Meaning like when he was younger, if he knew the responsibility was he would have, he would have walked away from it. Sure. Right? You know, so a lot of times I think life gives you just enough or brings you the people in your life at just the right time to evolve into your greatness where mm-hmm. you need to be or that hero. So I went back to school, uh, graduated my degree. And then in 2005, Whitney and I opened up uh, our office in Houston, Texas. We became the largest clinic in the history of the profession. We saw, you know, peaking at 2,800 pe- people per week. That's crazy, And that's man. 28X, the normal office. That's crazy. Um, just amazing. And just helping hundreds of thousands of people. How did you get to 2,800 you know. a week? Man, I know people that struggle to do that in oh, six I'll months, tell you, I know. I'll tell you exactly <laughs> yeah. um, how to do it. Um, when I first came out of school, I was struggling, you know, I took the insurance like, because yeah. the reason why you take insurance as a medical profession is because, you know, you, you want someone to pay you, right? <laughs> right. That's what it comes to, right? right? You got to start somewhere. <laughs> and you're, you're insecure. Mm-hmm. Well, people like me and say, listen, you could pay me a copay or you could pay me full care. Like, so we, we have some, some issues going on in insecurity and, and, and we know, well, if people have to pay less, maybe they'll, they'll go for it. So I, I, did what, I did what every doctor was supposed to do, I'd take insurance, do this. And then when I would actually, if I, number one, I didn't like to speak, but if I was asked to speak or present, I thought the key was give you a lot of information and, and, and uh, content, meaning I had a PowerPoint, I had tons of words on the PowerPoint, no pictures, a lot of heady research. And I try to impress you with big words. Sure. Because I thought that's what you're supposed to do. I, I remember I even, I even wore a white coat. <laughs> okay. uh, and I'm thinking, you know, uh, you know, what's it's like a butcher jacket, right? It really, you don't, <laughs> none of us really deal in blood. <laughs> so, you know, but it was this, this persona that you thought you had to come off in, educated. And it was really a lot of good information. And that's pretty much the response I got. Hey, that was great information. And it was good information. And so here was the experience that happened in my life. Um, just like I had an experience with my health. I always call it an experience. So never, here, here we call it a failure or a disease. Mm-hmm. So I was asked to speak at a, at a rotary club in the Woodlands, Texas. Now, the Woodlands Rotary, in the Woodlands, there a lot of big oils there. So you have yep. some billionaires in there. You have some top neurosurgeons. And that's old. It's OGs in there, like yep. old money. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and I, I was intimidated. I was like, wow, I'm going to go. Like, how can I out impress a neurosurgeon, the top, in the, one of the top in the world. Like, and so I had all this fear of what these people were going to think about me. And I was so scared that when I, I, I went and I showed up and I had forgotten all my blinky, shiny objects. I forgot my PowerPoint. All the tools, huh? I forgot. I, actually, my talk, I didn't really wow. talk. I was an orator, meaning that I had a book. And when I opened the book, it had the script in it. So it looked like it was a research book. It wasn't. It just had my exact script that I talked, right? I forgot it all. Wow. And I'm sitting there and I call my wife and Mike, I'm going to flake. I'm just going to leave. I just can't do this because I was so worried yeah. about what other people thought. And I was just sitting there and I got this epiphany. I'm like, you know what? I go, I'm just going to go. The, the one thing that no one could beat me on is my own story. Like my own life, my own experiences. Now, what I mean, guys, I don't mean my story, what I just told you of beating health. No, I mean like just I'm a kid that grew up in Melville, New York, to a, a dad named Gene and a mom made a land. Like, like everybody thinks they need this amazing story. No, you need, just people want to hear you and your life and your experience. And for me to get up there, I'm like, I'm just going to share my story in my life. And that I got a standing ovation, first time ever. And instead of people asking me for a card, people wanted to pay me to book an appointment then. Wow. I was like, oh, my so God. So start getting meetings on site. <laughs> so it wasn't content. It was context. Yeah. It was showing my life. It was making it real. And since then, I never really did tech anymore. I just went out when I speak. It's just me. And, you know, and uh, even today, like, I don't even like PowerPoints unless I need a picture to, to, prove, to show something that I'm, a point I'm getting right. But I, everybody's listening. Anything you do, I don't care if you're a personal trainer, a doctor, 
Um, you open up a cupcake shop. You know, tell your story. Like the best is, you know, I went to a restaurant and they say, have you ever been here? I'm like, no. They're like, here, let us show you. And they brought me through the kitchen. They told me the history of where it started. And they told me about how this, how that one pan in the back that was used by his great, great grandmother. And the story made the food taste better. hundred percent. Did you ever see that study where they sold a plastic banana on eBay? No. Okay, no. great. No, tell me this. <laughs> so this is a great story. This shows you the power of story. And don't let these guys, don't let a lot of people let's say, yeah, pay, you know, pay them, they want you to pay them 20 grand to, to look over your work. Like it's story, stories just telling you your life. So there was a banana, a plastic banana that um, didn't sell on eBay for like five cents. And then they put a story to it and they said this banana was used by the orangutan in one of Burt Reynolds' movies. Uh, what was it? It was one of the, it was uh, not, not Cannonball, but it was another, okay, yeah, one yeah. of his other movies. Classics, so, yeah. Sold for 60 bucks. Then they said <laughs> uh, just a regular pair of chopsticks didn't sell on there. And they said it was uh, chopsticks that actually Bruce Lee uh, in one of his uh, quarters from his old estate, they had $120 chopsticks. Hilarious. So of course they told the people was, it was not really the truth, but just showed you the power of a story of, of bringing in context behind mm-hmm. your message. So everybody listening, no matter what you do, even if you don't own your own business, your story means the world. Cause let's say I work, let's say I'm number five in a company. But I could say, hey, listen, let me tell you what I've seen working here. You know what I mean? Like you could you could bring your story and make it real, and that right there builds the trust. Um, you don't have to have these power persuasion techniques. Nothing beats reality, especially in a social media world today, where people are actually craving connection. A hundred percent, right? Real connection. Yeah, man, man. man you know what's funny too? That's that, that's really good too because. It's a perfect transition, really, because when you talk about people building up value, and that's one of the things that I talk about on the show a lot. It's called Real Value Exchange, obviously. But it's one of those things, man, where people think that value only comes through more features mm. or doing more things or, as you were, do, you know, as you were doing extra presentations, having more information yeah. packed into that talk time, right? But instead, the value is connection, mm. relationship, you know, like, you know, being present with people, eye-to-eye contact. That's why I always like to do my actual podcast in person because I'm like, man... I kind of want to get to know my actual guests. I just don't. Yeah. I, I mean, if I can, we always can. But um, that that builds the actual value and what people are actually willing to invest in. So I just want to say and that. And we we don't want. I don't think any of us want a client relationship for a day yeah. or even a week. We want it for a lifetime. Yep. And in fact, it's funny that you said. I was just I just kind of put it together. Like in my office, because you know I had this. You know. Late, later on, and we could probably swing around to it, you know, we moved to Park City, Utah. Mm-hmm. And my office is 1,500 miles away. So how do you run an office that's 1,500 miles away? I do want to ask you about that. but, yeah, right? but yeah, so yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll get there. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll circle around to it. Uh, but what I did early on is I really got sick of seeing and buying storage units to, to put x-rays and files of people who became patients. They even got amazing results, and they stopped coming. Sure. Or they quit. Or basically the way I, the way I really have to become self-aware, um, something... I, I did not maintain value because mm. in the beginning that patient saw, wow, I'm investing time and money in myself. Mm-hmm. And there was a, there was a, a, a moment where they felt they were spending time and money, right? There's mm-hmm. a very difference. The, the moment they feel they're spending time or money versus investing time and money themselves, then they would leave or they would have excuses or just use the value. So I said, you know what, when I meet a patient for the first time, I'm going to talk about lifetime care from the very beginning. Like in order for me to really make a difference, legacy difference in someone's life mm-hmm. is not if I see him for a day. Sure, I could help you in a day. Sure, I could help you in a, in a season. But the long-term effect, what I could do in your legacy and your future in a lifetime, is it's, it's, the, it's the dream of me. It's the fulfilling of my purpose and also uh, a legacy for them. And so I started uh, creating lifetime VIP. So you would just work with me for three months. At three months, it was lifetime or, or hey, we shook hands and I loved you anyway. Right. So we built a base of 1,200 lifetime patients. Mm. And like $150 per month. And without even having ha- had to get a new patient, you know, you're consistently, you know, your bottom line is 150000 cash a month, not even worrying about it. Mm-hmm. So what that also does is you have family. There are lifetimes. We never talk money, right? Meaning that, like, we only talked when your expiration date was out. So they knew there was a culture that, hey, I'm in this lifestyle for the rest of my life. Right. I'm doing this for the rest of my life. And what I noticed, what I really appreciated, I went back. Uh, to the office for about two weeks. And I said, hey, Whitney, I go, guess how many new people I met today? And she thought I was going to say like a bunch. I'm like, four. And what I mean by that is, well, the crappy news is I only met four new people. But the amazing thing is all those hundreds of patients 
were my lifetimers that I built a relationship with over time. So even though I was gone, the culture was still there. And so otherwise, if I built a business of just come in and they just left, I never really focused on that lifetime relationship. Mm-hmm. My business would have, would have been disappeared. Right. The fact that so the entire business was now sustained by lifetime patients. We don't need 100 new patients to become members a month. It could be 15, right? I mean, it's just something where I think it's so important when whatever you're doing, and I know, even if you sold a car or a real estate, you know, like a real estate, like there's plenty of people that you build. It's all about building a lifetime relationship. Uh, just that's always the end goal. And But here's the thing. Start with lifetime relationship. Mm. Like I think a lot of people, they, they try to just get them for the day or for the season. 100%. And they, and they do the, the, the bait and the switch. Quick like, sale type stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I'd rather, I rather let go with a quick sale. Mm-hmm. For a couple people, in order for the long term relationship process of having a relationship with a person, because here's the thing: it's not just a relationship for your business, but you never know when you need a favor, and they know someone like like it's all these unknowns that could happen. But the lifetime relationship: if you go in saying I'm looking for a lifetime relationship, that's because it makes you see the way you run business and the way you treat your customer in a totally different light. Man, you know, um, I think that's, man, that's, that's really valuable. And I hope, hope the audience really grasps, grasps that because it's something that you have to start with, right? You can't, you can't put it in at the middle. You can't, mm-hmm. you know, you can't finish with it after you close the deal and say, now let's stay friends. <laughs> you get Because you know. your intention is different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How, and how bipolar is that? Because you start, <laughs> your, your, your intention is, I need to just close the deal. I just need to pay the bill. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, we're switching to like this person who cares. You know, it's just, you, you cannot, yeah, the intention is different. So if you just start with the, I sorry, started with the intention of lifetime, and I also created requirements, meaning that I went back with my team and I said, everybody right now, who is your favorite client? Or someone, I would ask someone when I work with uh, people in my, in my masterminds, who's your favorite patient, your client, whatever. And they're going to, they're gonna, they literally, you see their eyes look up to the left, and they start to talk about Mary. Well, tell me about Mary. And they tell me all the attributes of Mary. And what people don't realize, when you think of your favorite client or your favorite patient or your favorite person you work with, what you're, what you're actually seeing is you're seeing the reflection of your characteristics and your 100%. values. People don't realize that because if, if I tell someone what's your values, they're going to give me the success one-on-one answers. Yep. Well, I want someone who's ethical and, and no, 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 no. I love, why do you love Buzz? Man, he comes in and he's so happy. He's vibrant. He's a lifetimer. He has a great relationship with his wife and kids. He paid cash. Uh, when he comes in, he says, hello, everybody. You know, and he brightens up the office. He, he brings, so when you talk about someone else and I'm talking about these great qualities that get me excited, mm-hmm. I'm like, I would love, if I worked with a hundred of those people every week or every day, I would never burn out. Right. And so what am I do- What are we doing in that exercise? What I'm doing is I'm telling you my inner values that I because it's very tough for us to introspect and find our inner values. Mm-hmm. So that's why I use a technique called mirroring. Yeah. Like I'll tell you, you know, who's your favorite superhero, and then you'll tell me, oh, Iron Man. You'll tell me why, but you're just describing yourself, and then I have to bring that and say, this is who you really are. And and you know what? That's so cool because a lot of times people do just mirror a lot of their thoughts and beliefs about the mm-hmm. world. Uh, people that comment on their social media yeah. stuff, they're just giving them what's inside them already, right? I mean, I mean they aren't really, um, you know, pulling this from, yeah. from some um, external place. They're just yeah. spitting out what's already yeah. built up within them. So how do you get people to kind of see themselves in their best light? I mean, that's... A, well, well, like just you and I, we're jamming together because yeah. we have a great chemistry because, yeah. you know, if we distill things down, we have very similar values, work sure. ethics, and experiences. Sure. And of course, we're going to be attracted to that. Sure. I mean... Automatically. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, yeah. Like, as soon as I saw you in the elevator, right? I was like, yeah, we're going to link. This so is good. just like if there was <laughs> yeah. something, you know, right? Of yeah. course, because yeah. we're attracted yeah. to that. So the way we do it is like, um, like if it isn't a business, I say to everybody has a no one. Oh, I don't have a favorite. Yes, you do. So who's your favorites? <laughs> yeah. And I want you to write down every reason why they're favorite. You know, like, so I'm going to use a doctor, for example. So they're like, yeah, they paid cash or they, uh, they're lifetimers. So they're, they refer a lot of people. They're fully engaged, meaning that if they have a little party, they show up to the party. They're part of the culture. They get it. Um, they tell others. They have a lot of positive energy, meaning that when, when you might be having a rough day, they walk in and they raise the energy of the office. So when, it, when, I, when they start saying that, I write everything down. I'm like, this is your values. And they sit there going, they're my values. Because that's why they like those people. We right. like people that mirror and reflect our same values, plain and simple. True. True. And so if, that, if, that, if they are the values, the true values, not the that you read in some book, if they're the true values, now I made sure, because remember, I want those lifetime people I, and lifetimers, 
have my same similar values. So now I built processes and procedures that cultivated and really spoke to those values. Mm. So if someone's coming in, I'll use just a, a, a doctor, a doctor uh, one uh, where they just want to uh, build a work comp case. No, I'm, I'm there to help change your life, man. You know, I, I'm, I'm there for you to take. So it doesn't work. So, so when you, when you specify your values, you also know what doesn't hit the bullseye. Sure. And what's even better about them, then that polarizes and keeps those people out of your business, office, or life, because you could use this in anything, that will cause drama, trouble, a lot of pain, a lot of misery, for some people, lawsuits. So it's just a great way. We could, I mean, you could do that exercise even with a relationship, meaning like, well, you know, who are the people you really like? Well, this person's fun, and this is, and you really get to see, because you know, it's very hard for us to look in the mirror and say, these are my values, because our head gets involved. And we're trying to say something that we heard or sounds romantic, but in reality, it's like, no, no, no. You know, you see it in the reflection of the people that you're attracted to. So someone could be like, I remember even now with the I Am Hero Project, and I said, you know, when I like speakers like an Anthony Robbins or stuff like that, a lot of people model people. Right. They'll say, oh, and they model them. And modeling is good. Like if, if, I'm, if I modeled someone, I could copy, and I would probably get better results than I'm getting now. But eventually, even though I model somebody, I'm still going to have underdeveloped individuality, meaning that I'm still going to be a counter-aversion to somebody else. So I realized, because I used to be a modeler, I used to, I, and I knew people used to talk like uh, people, different people, their accent would change, their right. mannerisms, they would dress a certain way, and they did get results, but I realized, why did I like certain speakers? And I realized it wasn't because of the words they said, it wasn't the way they carried themselves. I, I said, you know what it was? I'm just admiring someone who's super comfortable in being who they are. And that's what I loved about it. So it wasn't walking like them, talking like them. It was just, how can I allow myself? And then I realized, well, if I copy them, then I'm going against what I admired about them, which was being comfortable being me. Man, you know, it's one of those things where modeling, and I would love to get your actual take on this. It can be a good start, but like you said, man, it leads you down this way that eventually you get to a place where you're like looking in the mirror like, who am I though? Who am I? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've done that as well. I mean, I've looked at some people well, and I said, well, yeah, and, and, and I'm like, man, I'm going to, that guy's killing it. I want to be a great salesperson. And um, I would start off being horrible sales. And that was because I was all transaction. You know, I was all, yeah, yeah. I'd get in there, you know, and I was like, oh, I want to please and just people pleasing. And, and it was just like, you know, but that's, it left you like feeling like empty. And because I was modeling other people who I thought were good at sales. And then I was like, you know, you know what? I can't, I can't do business this way. Because I don't like how I look this way, you know? Mm-hmm. It wasn't that my number, and my numbers sucked too. <laughs> but, but, but not only did my numbers suck, but I didn't like who I was. And it was just like a double hit, right? And so I was like, I got to do something different, man. And, I, and it was this process of trying to find my own voice. I mean, like, and you know, I, I say it's a process because it wasn't an overnight thing for me. Yeah. And um, so, you know, whenever you're coaching people and helping your clients and helping other business owners, find that, find, go through that process, man. Like, What's that look like a little bit? Because, I mean, I could tell you mine, but I would love to hear how, how you get it yeah, out. Well, well, I definitely think modeling is great in the beginning. I tell people, apprentice. Yeah. You know, if you're starting from zero, find someone who's done it and learn from their mistakes and apprentice. I go in. Fast appre- track almost. Yeah, yeah, right? Apprentice mm-hmm. until you start getting some income. Then when you get some income, then do like Bruce Lee says, absorb what's useful, discard what isn't, and then make it uniquely your own. So this is where you're starting to find your truth and your voice. This is when you start questioning why. And then you find it to be your truth. And then allow that process to go. But you're so right. Like, everybody knows the feeling of looking in the mirror and going, who am I? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times you see those movies in Wall Street and they get burnt out. It's (laughs) because that's what it is. They they were somebody else and they got the results, but they realized it was still under, they they were kind of a version of somebody else. And the world needs you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need somebody else. And so it's a lot of times the way I know what's happening to that person is they're having feelings of numbness, depression, disengagement. Um, midlife crisis type of feeling stuff, and they don't know why. And I'm like, because you're not aligned with your truth. That's that secret identity I talk about. It's just you're living a less than watered down version of your truth. You're living. It's like if I, if I put clothes on, I'm wearing someone else's shirts, uh, pants that are too long, shoes that are too big. Like I'm I'm trying to wear other people's values on my life, and I'm not wearing the actual garments that, that I was created to wear. Right. And that's that fine. That's the reason why someone, I would say, is grieving their potential. I use that term, grieving, grieving their potential. Grieving their potential. Okay. Right? Because like well, that's that feeling. Yeah. It's like... I got everything. I checked off the boxes. How come I feel this way? And it's because I'm grieving me. I'm grieving who I was always created to be because, you know, a lot of people are where they're at because they, someone else thought it would be good for them. Right. 
And they realize, well, wait a second, I'm living out other people's values, and I never give, I n- never give myself permission to say, well, what do I like, and what do I do? And here's the problem: now those questions come in late twenties, thirties, and forties, and okay. sometimes people say, "Oh my God, I, I can't start to, I can't rekindle a relationship with who I am now." I mean, I'm 35, I'm 40. It's like, and it's so much easier to just go into the comfort and torment right. of what you've always been doing. Because uh, at least it's there. But I tell people, you continue to go through because at the other side of this crisis of life, you're not going to see the person you think you are or even what you think you wanted to be. You're going to actually be reintroduced to who you always were created to be. And for some people, they got to be willing to make that decision. It might be a different relationship. It might be a different job. It might be... Uh, it's, but it's, it's, it's worth everything because it's actually, you're, you're reattaining. Joseph Campbell said that the journey of the hero was not about discovery. It was about rediscovery. It wasn't about attaining something. It was about mm. reattaining that all the powers and everything you needed were inside you the whole time. So it was almost like we were kids and we were born these heroes. Mm-hmm. And through, through teachers and preachers and dogmas and societies and belief systems, we, we forgot. And we lived out other people's values. And there's a choice made between that 30 and 50 where we have to decide to reattain or rediscover or sit in that complacency and torment of what I call the secret identity and just kind of be okay with not wanting to go through that. Man, you know, and and this is where I I would say what you experienced earlier in life Mm -hmm. probably had a huge plus to, uh, to being able to push through and actually find out who you are now, right? How old are you, by the way, if you don't mind me I'm 41. Asking. I'll be 42 in November. You look, look, amazing, for, you look amazing for 42, yes. too, bro. Gonna... Seriously, man. I mean, it's one of those things where I think a lot of people, when they get to, I'm about to be 35, mm-hmm. and it's like when you're in this stage of the game, you're like, all right, I'm somewhat established. I got my base going. I got a lifestyle that's, that's already set. I can't rock the boat and try, to, mm. and try to get to who I'm supposed to be, right? I mean, one of the scariest things to me, though, and it kind of always shakes me out of that, is like I'm afraid not to know what, like what was possible? Like yeah. I'm, like I'm afraid of what if statements later on in life it scares the crap it's out. It's regret. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the greed and the potential. And you're yeah. so right about that because what you just said is this: when we have a thermostat, so mm-hmm. there's the hierarchy of needs. Once we get to the point financially where we have a little bit of security, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, this is what happens in life. When we first start out. Security, financial security, is kind of the big driver. Yeah, we hustle, yep. we grind. We'll get two or three jobs because yep. we're enjoying that. Because we're like, someday uh, that I'm not, I'm going to overcome that. that I'm going to have it, <laughs> and we nail it, and we get there. So things are good, all right? I got that. And actually, these studies say it, it happens. Starts happening around seventy to seventy-five thousand a year. Mm-hmm. People start going. They start relaxing a little bit. A little, little, I call it that fact. They get a little comfortable, right? Mm-hmm. But then... Get a little comfort weight and everything else. After. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But because now that yeah. security is being met, yeah. do you want more? Yeah, I want more. But you're not starving. Yep. Uh, do you want a million? Sure, I want a million. But, I'm sure. but then what starts to happen, it starts shifting from money being the security to now happiness, mm. fulfillment. You know, I want to build... I, you know, I, I had a, 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 um, a businessman, an entrepreneur startup that I was, uh, you know, uh, coaching with. And uh, I was working with him. And he had a... He was doing great... But he's like, he was working for another company and making a lot of money. But he's like, you know what, I this what if. He's like, but I just want to know that I built something on my own. Hmm. You know, so it was about a happiness. It was about value. So then we make the switch, but then we're scared to jump because when you make that jump or you make that transition, then that money you're ma- you were making that took you out of the, the scarcity into I'm secure, that's now threatened. And you sure as hell don't want to ever go back to the thermostat of saying, now I get to hustle and grind sure. to make that money. So it puts you in that weird state of, I feel the security and that's may- maybe comfortable, but now I want to chase happiness and fulfillment. But what happens if in chasing happiness and fulfillment that I know that would change my life and be amazing for me, but what happens if that thermostat, thermostat of money goes off because it drops mm-hmm. and now I'm, I gotta like, I'm going to go back into grind just to make money mode and then put off my happiness and fulfillment. So they get stuck in that little in-between area where I always tell them, listen, if you always go after your happiness and fulfillment, because if you, if you feel burnt out, numb, and depressed, you're never going to make 
the money you wanted anyway. So at least if you if you go after the happiness and fulfillment or something like when we're talking right now, if everybody could you can see us close up, we're both sweating. <laughs> yeah. We're both uh, yeah, we're to it, yeah. We have way we have way more energy than when we first started. hundred um, <laughs> yeah. percent. our time doesn't matter right now. Yeah. Like there's we're t- we're in vertical time. Very yeah. important. Like we live in we live in linear time, most uh, like past Friday. We're in vertical time. It doesn't matter the time. We could forget to eat, we could forget to sleep, but just like yeah. we're in because we're in flow. Yeah. And so the thing is in this moment right now, and the fact that we're sweating and we're not doing cardio, yeah. so something's happening physiologically in us. Like our cells are vibrating higher. Um, I believe this is the ultimate state of well being. I don't think cancer or disease could exist in flow. Wow. So why wouldn't we always crave to be here? A hundred percent. Right? Yeah. Why would I only want to be here four hours a week? So, see, when you find something you love, you desire, that becomes your flow, will always outwork because the, the, the actual act of us doing this interview is our reward. Mm-hmm. Isn't that great? So, period. Your father said, so I'm expressing love to you and appreciation. You express, express, so, like, this, it's a self-fulfilling, like, flow. So if I just focused on achieving that in my life... Mm-hmm. Then I, de- if anything, the chances of me making more money than I could ever dream imaginable—that's the opportunity. And so your whole your whole mindset is really focused on getting people into that flow state to mm-hmm. where the, they aren't even thinking about the pain that they're going through. Right. I mean, be, be, because because yeah. I mean, one of the best things I learned from training at a young age is that. Man, you're not going to get the results unless you put yourself through some pressure mm-hmm. and a little bit of you got to break down some muscle fibers. There's got to be a little yeah. bit of ache that has to happen. You're not going to just show up and do, yeah. you know, uh, incline walk and then go home and think life is, you know, you're going to have this amazing physique. Yeah. You got to have okay heart. You know, you know, you, your health will be okay, but you're not going to get some peak status. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be in the top 1% doing that. You, you got to break something down. But what you're saying, though, is get in that flow state. Mm-hmm. And you don't even think about the breakdown. No, like, is, is like, that right, Art? Yeah, like when you went on that five mile run this morning, yeah. it's like at the end of it, you felt way better than when you started. Hundred percent. Like your, your physiology changed, your your chemical system changed, your thought process changed. Like you were you were in what I call penthouse thoughts. I believe there's basement thoughts and penthouse thoughts, mm. and this is my belief. Like they still have not proved that thoughts really originate in your brain. I don't know if you saw studies on that. That's really cool. What mm. I mean is like there there is a possible thesis that. Depending on our vibrational state and mood, that's the type of thoughts we actually can have access to. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a basement thought thinker, what's that mean? If I eat like crap, if I don't move and I'm kind of depressed and sluggish and the world's against me, I'm a victim, I only have access to these basement level types of thoughts Mm -hmm. that just continually pour more of that into me. But like when we get out there, we move and we exercise and we put ourselves through this and our endorphins are up and our vibrations are up. Like when you're done with that run, I mean ideas thought you're in i call penthouse thoughts and yeah. then we come together with other penthouse people and we have access to these amazing ideas and amazing think tank type of things like the uh, napoleon hill called the mastermind you bring mm-hmm. these people together and you have these amazing life-changing altering thoughts uh, for the world so that's why that's that flow state and a lot of book on flow state tells you about the flow state they tell you about michael jordan yeah. and he could, but but it's like but it's not basic enough for people to say well oh that's michael jordan that's colby no, no, no. It's like, what do you do that gives you more energy at the end of doing it? Because, like, I don't need a nap. Like, mm-hmm. people think I'm tired. No. When you're tired and heavy, you don't need a nap. You're, out of, you're, out of, you're, you're not aligned with your truth. You need to actually do the thing that puts you in flow. Like, so it's not about napping. It's not about um, sleeping more. It's about, even though sleep is good, don't get me wrong, but you guys got what I'm saying. It's like, what, what, what thing do you have your more energy at the end of it that uh, you would do, like... If I give you $50 million right now, what, what would you do? Oh, I would do this. Why? Because this is what I love to do, right? What, what could you talk about all night long? What, mm-hmm. would, would people come up and ask you questions about all the time? So the whole thing is these are very easy questions that people could answer and say, okay, okay that feeling that we're having right now, like right. the feeling we're having right now together in this interview, this is our heroic guidance system saying you're on the right path. That's it. So if we if we were doing this interview and it felt heavy, I was exhausted, I was tired, <laughs> then it was it would be my heroic guidance system saying you're off somewhere. Yeah. And a lot of times, especially men, if you're listening, men, we're told to totally negate our emotions on a lot of things. True. Whether it be sports, whether like so this whole intuition, but that that feeling of heaviness and depression and numbness, it's all because we're failing to express what we always want to express. So I always tell people, go after that thing that makes you feel amazing, excited, even if it's just 15 minutes a day. Mm-hmm. It's greater than any drug. It literally, it's putting your body, you almost connect to this like universal source of power 
that keeps the world going around. Man, you, you know, um, I think that's so powerful, man, because that's a much better focus to have than just happiness or comfort. Yeah. I mean, man, comfort to me, it really, it really is weird how that works because very few positive things in the long haul happen mm-hmm. from comfort. Absolutely. Temporary, yeah. Comfort's great. I mean, you know, laying oh, up man. on the beach. I know. I but know. you lay up on the beach for 10 years, man, you're going to kill yourself. <laughs> you're going to get up. So right. <laughs> I mean, so very few things are like, all right, this comfort level, temporary, enjoy it. Long, long term, it might be the worst thing in the world for you, man. I can't think of a worse drug than comfort right now. Joe, you're so nailed it on the head. So, what I, and because of it, I want to redefine, for, uh, no, I want to define more clearly the, the terminology I'm using so people understand what I'm talking about. Like I mentioned before, like I sit here and I'm expressing love. Mm-hmm. And as I express love to you, I'm experiencing love. But that word love, we all have a different association. And really, yeah. I think in life, none of us really grew up with unconditional love. None of us. Because we're human beings, it's always conditional. In some way, shape, or form. I say that too, but yeah. Right? So let me, let me define love when I'm saying that. Like when I'm sitting here with Joe and you guys right now, love to me is unconditional appreciation. Hmm. That means I appreciate you no matter what you did or what you didn't do. or what, You know, like, like, like no matter what, right now, I just want to say I appreciate and acknowledge you. Everybody listening that you took the time, I just, like it comes from such a state of appreciation, but unconditional. I love you. There's no right, wrong. There's no judgment. And when you were saying about comfort, instead of looking to be just happy, the thing is like, or positive, right? Right. The issue with being, I would rather be in a state of appreciation than positive because I could find appreciation even when things aren't good, right? You always hear this. I have, but you know what? I know we're, I know we're in a bad state, but Hey, at least we got each other. Like, you know, appreciation is something we could find in the moments that are, there's nothing positive to be found. That's a man. I I, I feel like I could stop right there. I mean, because that's the biggest takeaway. I think if anybody heard that, that's, that's the biggest take home that anybody can roll with because regardless of where you are, man, I really appreciate you saying that. I I appreciate you just kind of coming here with the, with the right energy and mindset. Yeah. I'm not sure if you had 10 hours of sleep last night or no, man. 10 cups of coffee. But Look I at mean, my story. I was up at 4 in the morning. Come on. <laughs> oh, man, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, 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 I mean, but, man, that, that right there is, is a heavy hitter for me, man. So I want to transition from that because I don't yeah. think I can do anything better <laughs> besides what you said there about coming from appreciation. Man, but you I, know what I mean? Like, I do. And, and let's even clarify that more. Like people yeah, say, please. as long as you're in a state of gratefulness. Yeah. But I would rather appreciate than being grateful because watch, when I'm grateful, that means I'm saying, I'm glad I'm not like that person. Wow. Right? Oh, at least, hey, I'm glad we were able to sit here because there's some people without a roof over their head. So when I'm grateful, I'm still focusing on the external on, on, or something negative that I'm glad I'm not. It's a big take. Right? Where appreciate, it's like, that person who's living without, you know, uh, you know that, that child who doesn't eat, you know, maybe they eat once or twice a week because there's starvation in their town, but you see them playing mm-hmm. and you see them happy, I'd be like, wow. So when I see something that's, I, wow, I could appreciate that they still have joy, even in a situation where I probably would be complaining. So I'm, a, so see, when I appreciate, I could appreciate someone that their life isn't the most positive. Hmm. So that's why gratefulness, when we're grateful, we're still have a level of comparison, right? Well, I'm glad I have food on my table, right? They're, we're comparing it to somebody else who's less than. Mm-hmm. We appreciate, it's unconditional, man. I love you. Like, it doesn't matter who's at the table. Like, we all have something, one, you know what I mean? So appreciation is like this unconditional, beautiful place. And I would rather strive for pre- unconditional appreciation. And always, so no, if you're listening right now, no matter where you're at, if you find yourself complaining, you could automatically go to some level of unconditional appreciation because you know it doesn't have to be positive or you don't have to be happy or the world could be against you but in that moment you could say well you know what i'm not grateful i could appreciate that i do have a job right man you know know? 1000 percent, man i'm really glad that we that we stayed there too because you know that's a that that's a i haven't heard that before i'll be honest with you because a lot of people say, hey, you have to be grateful. Tell me, write down things that you're grateful yeah. in the morning. Uh, you know, and, and, and having gratitude is, is great. Yeah. I mean, it's something I try to tell myself. And mm-hmm. I'm naturally a positive guy. I've always been that way. But, I mean, but, you know, even, but 
you're not always positive. Not every always day is not perfect. And being grateful does have this hint of negativity that we don't like to really talk about. Yeah, I'm not like you. Yeah, Dad. yeah. They're <laughs> not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My car is AC, you know. <laughs> yeah, and yours doesn't. Or whatever yeah. it is, man. And, and it's crazy that we, that we slip that in, but it's still taking away from us appreciating mm. and being present in the moment of where we are. Because that's really all you have. Like, nobody, like, at this interview, I can get in a major car accident. Yeah. Something crazy happened to me, oh, God forbid. But, I mean, that, that stuff happens to people every day. And so, but all you have is the moments, right? And so being able to get stuck in the moment is what appreciation does for you. That's the only power we have is in the moment. Yeah. Like, people talk about the past like it's the good old days. Yep. And then, actually, <laughs> actually, the pre- most people see the present as the lowest point. Because we talk about the future like it could be better or hopefully it'll be better. The Back in the day was the good old days. But when they realize, like, right now is the only time we have any power whatsoever. Like, the choice we're making right now in the moment in vertical time is the only power of creation we have right now. Because the future didn't happen. The past is just an illusion of what we see it to be it's totally an illusion you know it? what i mean right yeah, it just, it's just totally it's not even it's just a memory of the way we uh, wanted to see it and we tweak it all the time right right <laughs> yeah. but right now yeah is where i have all my power dude i love it yeah. man man so i, I want to talk about your i am hero yep. project um are these some of the ta- i mean are, are these some of the strategies that you Dude, teach your people? Yeah, this is this is all part of the Hero Rising methodology. Okay, we take people through, and it's and you know the reason why you appreciate it and you feel it's uh, unique and different and it fresh is, different. Yeah. is because you know I told my wife I'll never write a book and I'll never do something unless I feel it's original because mm-hmm. I don't want to I don't want to sound I don't want to have a meme that sounds like everybody else like mm-hmm. I, that's why all my social stuff it's all it has to it had to be downloaded to me like I call it download but you know I, there was a good three or four months where I had original download I stopped reading all books I never wanted to be a carbon copy of somebody else sure. and so the, these concepts really truly help people and how we developed them the way that I'm here project started was this I checked off of the boxes. So let's do the checked off the boxes. So I was 35 when it probably started. Looking back, it was probably 35 when this whole thing started happening. Okay. Checked off of the boxes, meaning, you know, I built my dream home, you know, mm-hmm. paid. And we built it and paid cash, right? So beautiful practice, helping people. Every human needs being met. Lamborghini, my dream car, Lamborghini in the garage. Had fun with it. And, it pre, you know, took people around. And we just had a lot of fun with it. Kids, two healthy kids, taking care. Everything's there. Checked yeah. off all the boxes. Yeah. Then I started feeling heavy. I started feeling a little depressed. I started feeling numb and then disengaged. And then, Interesting. Okay. But here's yeah. the thing. Yeah. I wouldn't even have that conversation with you because I'm like, who am I going to tell about this? Sure. Without them saying, dude, you're ungrateful. You're blessed. <laughs> like, like, but yeah. I wasn't ungrateful. Yeah. I just felt like I didn't know the emotion, so I'm just going to tell you what I felt. Like I felt like there was like this beast in this cage or like this unfinished business. Like, I got to know this. There was something, and it was really bugging me. And uh, I really couldn't hide it. And then one day, I heard my son Justice in the other room. I was like in my office, and he's in the other room. And I hear him go, "Hey, mom." He goes, "Mommy." He goes, "What happened to Daddy?" Wow. But Joey said in a way such as this, like, "What happened to that leader and that world changer and that that man? like like I lost my mojo or something?" I know exactly. It, I didn't just hear it a certain way. Like he was just like, "You felt him." What happened to that guy? Like like he lost something. And I knew I couldn't, I could have might have fooled a lot of people and my patients and my, even my wife, but I couldn't fool him because that's the, that's the uniqueness about a child. A child didn't forget. Hmm. A child has the qualities that, of that hero and he, and he knew. And so I just kind of secluded myself. I, you know, I have a sauna. I would go in the sauna and just say, listen, I'm not coming out of here until I know my why. I question my why, my purpose. And I was like, why do I want to do this? I'm like, well, I want to help people. But it was a success one one answer, right? Mm-hmm. I want to help people. No, not this is me to me. Come on, no bullshit. Mm-hmm. Why do I want to? Do, well, I want to see people reach their potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why? Mm-hmm. And then I mean, I was just, I was just not feeling it. And then one day I was just so frustrated. I said, you know what? I just want to be admired for achieving great things and doing something in the world that's never seen before. You know, that's what I want to do. That's why. You know, that's it sounded selfish. I literally felt my heart take a deep breath and go, <sighs> like something shifted. Again, I don't know the words to explain, but something shifted. And I'm like, so out of me is coming out these words, admired, contribution, achievement. So I got on my phone. I'm typing in these words just to see. I'm, I'm, I'm searching. I'm trying to figure me out. And that's the toughest thing to do if you guys are listening is to, like, do self-therapy on yourself. Because it is, man. It's because you have the, all these things going against you. And when I look, typed in those words, achievement, admiration, contribution, I saw the definition of hero. 
my hero. And I clicked on it, and the definition of hero was one who is idolized or admired for courage, contribution, outrageous achievement, or nobility. Yeah. I was like, oh my god! Like I jumped, like my yeah. heart was jumping. Remember that feeling? Yeah. So something was rising on the inside, and I was awoken to the fact, and I remembered that was really the theme my entire life. And I realized, and I believe it's a theme of all of us, our entire yeah. life, even little girls in princess outfits. Like when I was a kid, I wore the superhero uniforms. You know, I worked out because yeah. I wanted to look like a hero. Sure. I won Mr. America, Mr. America, Mr. Universe to have a superhero title. I beat a life-threatening terminal disease to later on become a doctor. Why? So I could go save lives, right? Yep. And I was sitting there going, okay, so I had the achievements in my life. Like all of us, we have achievements. I had the contribution, but here's the thing that got me. I didn't have in the definition the courage hmm. to really allow myself to become who I was created to be. You know, that's really, that's, man, that, so this is like, this is a separate phase of life, man. This is an interesting phase, too, mm. because I care about how I feel first, because what I give to other people, won't, it'll be, it could be crap when I'm giving. If, I, if I'm not at my best, right? So I'm always pushing for my best. How did you get to that place saying, you know yeah. what, I, I got to start with me? I want to be a hero, right? Is, it, yeah. is that how you approach it? Yeah, well, the thing is, it has to be selfish. You know why? Yeah. To find your purpose is selfish because it's your purpose. Yep. Your pur- if your purpose is somebody else's purpose, it's codependence. And, you'll, <laughs> and it's, it's, putting, it's putting horrible expectations on somebody else that you're codependent on and horrible expectations on yourself. So even Mother Teresa, because well, let's talk about the most serving person we could think about, mm-hmm. or, Billy, or even a Billy Graham. Do you understand that what they did fulfilled a selfish need in them? Period. So whether it be Mother Teresa felt worthy, felt significant by helping people, like it all came down to it actually served her. Mm-hmm. And in her serving her selfish purpose, then everybody else got the best of her. So I call it being selfishly unselfish. Like so when I take care of me, Jim Rohn said it best, take care of you for me and I'll take care of me for you. Because if you don't take care of you first, and, it, and I, I could prove it right now, if your mom listening, and I love you, and you know, and you took, and all you do is you put yourself last to serve your family, serve your husband, serve your kids, and you're the one you're depressed because you don't feel sex anymore, mm-hmm. your sex drives down, you gained weight, and you, because you're getting the last of everything, and you believe a lie, whether it be from religion or whatever, mm-hmm. thinking that I got to put myself last, and here you're miserable. You know, so the thing is like, you have to take care of you so everybody else gets the best of you, plain and simple. Man, you know, do, do you think it's possible, and I'm just asking you here for the audience too, because do you think it's possible for people to start leading with trying to serve other people first? I mean, I hear that a lot, and I know that you challenge a lot of the old school wisdom yeah. on your podcast, so I'm, I'm, I'd love to get your thoughts yeah. on this for the audience. The reason why... We- when you realize the reason why I want to help people mm-hmm. is because I want to be a hero. Mm-hmm. You see the difference? I, w- I want to be a hero. So part of heroes, I'm going to go help serve other people because when I help serve other people, I'm going to be admired and idealized and I'm contributing to the world. So it's fulfilling my purpose. Mm-hmm. And those people happen to get – I also become the dealer of hope to those people as well. Right. So the hero – and let's go into the hero characteristics. Yeah, a lot please. of people believe – a hero is just this servant, humble, meek person. But people have to realize that, you know, uh, a hero has – number. well, let's go over these definitions to tell you, again, a dogma that we're, that we're led to believe. Everybody's sold to follow their passion, right? You've heard that. Always. So – and if you're listening to this right now, I want you to look up the definition of passion. And when you look up the definition of passion, it is um, ravage or, or barely uncontrolled emotions – it's barely or uncontrollable emotions. Other synonyms are frenzy, um, tantrums, um, <laughs> rage. So when I look at that definition, I'm like, wow, like we, we have spoke that over our life to follow our passion. And you're it just unbridled emotions. You're all over the place. Yeah. And we see a lot of people. They love life. They don't love life. They're the, or, or how about those people? Yeah, yeah, life's great. We're doing like they're always talking positive, but they're out of control. And really passion, that's, a, that, that's the definition of a villain. Like think of the villain. They're all out of control. They're frenzy. They're tantrums. But now look, let's, look at, let's look at the road we were told to never travel. My parents – and this is also part of my second uh, – my other secret identity I had. So my first secret identity was I found my identity in that of my job. 
So a lot of us, our job is our identity, so that defines us. But my second secret identity is I never, I never accepted gratitude, grace, admiration, or appreciation from my peers or my patients. Hmm. Meaning that they say, Dr. Zander, thank you so much for helping me. And what I would do, oh, no, 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 no. Your body healed <laughs> itself. And I would, I would push away yeah. any gratefulness, appreciation. I mean, that's what, that's what any person would say that they should do, right? right. Because otherwise, you're a butthole if you try to just take yeah. on all the, right. all the praise and, you know, and all the goodness people are trying to yeah. pour into you. And not even saying that. I know, but it's like yeah. I deflected it. So why? Because why? this is introspection. Because mm-hmm. I was raised in a dogma. That anything near or related to pride or ego was considered sinful, Hmm. anti-God, a bad person. So I swung the pendulum not to humility, but to false humility. Hmm. Now, what false humility does, it actually destroys the hero because it destroys your self-value. It destroys your self-worth. It destroys your self-esteem. And it allows you – then you start to actually – part of you starts to resent. Why? Because you're going against your true nature. Yeah. And then when you look at the definition of pride, the definition of pride is – One who finds pleasure or satisfaction in their achievements, the achievements of others like their friends and their family, or pleasure and satisfaction in the gifts and talents they've been given that are widely admired by others. And I go, there's no sin in that. Like, of course I'm proud of you when you're crushing it. And like, why wouldn't I want to be? And then ego is one sense of uh, of, uh, self-esteem or importance. And when I put them together, I'm like, wait a second, a hero knows that they feel that their message is important and they have confidence in their message and they take pride, they take pleasure and satisfaction in what they do and they, they, they take pleasure and satisfaction in helping others and seeing other people achieve. So when I put pride and ego together, I'm like, that's the character of a true hero. And a hero had pride, a hero has ego, and a, and a hero also has humility because see the humility part, a hero knows their weaknesses. And in the weakness comes the humility and in our weakness comes our courage because the definition of hero there was courage in there right. so we only find courage by going through our weakness but even though i'm scared and even though i'm going through the weakness i have enough pride and ego of my message and my purpose that i'm going to go through it anyway because i have that self importance i have that that drive in me mm-hmm. if i was meek and like oh, i wouldn't do it if I had no self-esteem or so, oh, no, no, and I would be eaten alive. So no one realized a hero has pride, has ego, has humility, and the actual passion that we're told to follow or like passionate or to serve others, that is literally maybe not to serve others, but the passion – is really the villainous nature of somebody yeah. all over the place and not saying, listen, I stand for this. My message is important. I have the confidence that my message and what I do as a human being could go help others. So there's – and then when people realize that they get a pride and ego and everybody – come on, guys. When you're alone in the house and you look in the mirror and you dance and you sing like – and you feel good about yourself or, or when a woman puts on a nice dress and she looks in the mirror, she doesn't let anybody see but she there's that little part of her who wants to feel sexy, right. important. Right? So the thing is – but we feel in society, you know why? Because society promotes mediocrity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so true. And a hero yeah. is not is not yeah. is is, is uh, mediocrity has no room for someone who feels what they do is important and t- take pleasure and satisfaction in what they do and have esteem in what they do. That's so true, man. You know, you will get that almost from no one yep. to actually tell you to to. to to really have an ego, to go about your business, do your thing, push through, and just a just a just a God given person who you're built to be. People don't really talk like that, you know. I mean, I mean, but however, though, it's it's funny how this it's funny how this kind of balances out too, though, right? Because there's no greater feeling than whenever you just give and there's you're in that flow mm. state and you're in that moment, right? Taking back to that vertical time that you talked yep. about. There's no greater feeling than that. And you're just giving this to, to the audience, giving it to the podcast. Yeah. I mean, I didn't pay you to come out here. You didn't have to do this. You got no, things to do. We love it, man. <laughs> you, you know, but at like, the same time, yeah. I take pleasure and satisfaction yeah. in our time together in, in my message. Yeah. You see, so people like, you yeah. can have it all. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the way yeah. I see it, if you're listening, yeah. Pride and ego, I yeah. want you to think of it as potentials. And we're in a no greater place to talk about this in Vegas. Yeah. Pride and ego are, and money are potentials, <laughs> meaning this. They're, they're hero enhancers. Sure. If I give pride, ego, and money to a gambler or someone with a, a heart that's not really right or even a drug addict who's addicted, they're just going to be enhanced. They're going to be more of a gambler and they're going to have more of an addiction. But if you're listening right now, and I know it's you if, because you're listening, but if I give pride, which is pleasure and satisfaction, what you do, ego, self-esteem, and self-importance, what you do, and money and, and you, to, to someone such as yourself, you, Joe, that has a good heart, 
it enhances that. That's a full-blown hero. So it's an enhancer. So you give pride, ego, and money to someone who has an amazing heart and, and has uh, – you know, loves what they do and they know they could benefit others. And all, all that does is increases their potential. It increases their contribution. It, it, it increases their collaboration. Mm-hmm. It increases, increases their experiences. And they really turn into a full-blown hero. And that's when, when – that's, but you know what? It has to, has to really take that moment where you stand up and take that back and say, it's OK that I feel proud about myself. Like this secret celebrating sucks. Which all, <laughs> even in sports, right? Secret celebrating. Yeah, yeah, in yeah, sports yeah. when yeah. someone celebrates too much, yep. right? So Turn it's it like down. you should feel really good about your wins in life. But I think – oh my god. Marion Williamson said it best. There is no enlightenment in shrinking for the insecurity of others. Meaning that I cannot ever become so impoverished or in poverty to help someone in poverty. I cannot become so sick to help another in sickness. That, so what it's saying is all I could do is shine my light and be the greatest version of me mm-hmm. and follow my purpose the way I was created to be. And then I could allow people to see that and give themselves permission to do the same. That's phenomenal, man. I mean, you know, I mean, giving people – giving people um, – <laughs> A contrary thought about ego and pride is beautiful because pride is always now like, oh, pride comes right yeah. before the fall. You know, you, 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 I mean, you have all these pride, negativity, yeah. push that down, keep it to yourself. Wait till everybody reads the definition today. Today, mm-hmm. like, I just want to know this podcast mm-hmm. changed people's lives because people are going to look in their phone. They're going to look up the definition of pride, ego and passion, and it's going to freak them the heck out because you'll be like, oh, my God. They get, it's almost like they're going to realize I was told this. Mm-hmm. And why did my mom tell this? Because she was told this. But what if pride and ego was the path to the hero? Hmm. And there was actually the path to the life of the amazing relationships, of the amazing job that was always there for me. But we told that was the apple not to eat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's heavy, bro. It is, man. Man, man you know, um, I, I'm just thinking about you at 26 again. And, and you know, when you're going through that tough experience – and now that you're and you're in this new place, obviously yeah. you're not even close. <laughs> to, I could imagine. I didn't know you then, but yeah. I could imagine you're not even close to who you were at at, at 26. Yeah, and so, you know, what was the prideful moment then that kind of got you through that moment? Was there anything there that you can kind of look back on and say, "Man, I was scared then. I was, you know, I was being humbled. Doctors were telling me all this negative, all, all this, you know, negative type of operations are going to happen, organs implant, all this." Was there a pride? I mean, was there an ego or prideful moment? That kind of peaked? What it was for me is it helped me – my body – and when I say – when we say our body, it it was the intelligence of our body. So when I say the intelligence of the body, the innate intelligence that – if I cut my finger or you cut your finger, it heals. Like we don't think about it. But that same wisdom that like makes our heart beat right now and our – it's the same wisdom that kind of gives us that idea. So I think what that did for me, that moment of my body saying – Dude, I got this. Like, my brain wasn't there, meaning, like, I was in doubt, I was in fear, but my body was like, I got this. My, my, the wisdom that we, 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 again, we were distracted that we started as two cells, nine months, 70 trillion cells later, right. this miracle happens, and when we're born, everybody thinks that wisdom went away. No, we're still the miracle. Like, yeah. we're, like, it didn't come out with the placenta. It's like, we're, we're still the miracle. And so, going through that process, I was in awe that my body was able to heal itself from an irreversible – where man told me was impossible. So, sure. so, a, so a book smart doctor told me it is impossible. My body did the impossible and my brain, meaning that my thought process, my body was like, dude, you could, be in, you could think whatever you want, but the body's wisdom knew how to get well. Wow. And I think I got such an admiration – for the healing power of the body, how this wisdom inside us. And I realized the wisdom inside us was just not at a physical level. So I think during that process, I got almost as a separate person, me looking in on myself, I think I got pride and ego at how cool our body was. Mm -hmm. And then I had to realize, well, that body is me. You follow what I'm saying? And then that allowed me to get the pride and ego to go and start helping people now because I was very confident when it came to that point because I went through it. So I think that was the journey that allowed me to be impressed by what I was able to do. But it was like my body was one thing and my mind was something else, but I realized that we're all together. So I think that that going through that process is what 
allow me to appreciate and have pride and ego and how amazing the human being was created. Yeah. And then I think I really then leveraged that full time. And then as I evolved, I was helping people physically, mm-hmm. but going, well, wait a second, I'm just looking at one small part, the physical, but there's this, this whole other intelligence that the hero inside is that innate intelligence is how we think that amazing idea we have that flow state. Like when I do something, I feel excited. Like that's, that's my spirit call what you want. That's something telling me I'm on the right track. So I started paying more attention to the in- entire aspect of that inner hero than just the one thing. So I think that was a great question. No one ever asked me that. I think going through that process, I was like, an, I was, I had a front row seat to learning pride and ego for how we were all created. Man, you know, um, What's really interesting these days, you see a lot of, of uh, research coming out about the placebo effect and how, you know, you can get about 30, about, I think it's like 33%, 34% outcomes of giving someone sugar tablets yeah. or just doing some, you know, t- whatever you're into, yeah. right? And, and the mind goes in, it kicks in and says, okay, we're, we're going to go fix this. I think we don't even know what we're capable of, man. No idea. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think... I think when we came into this world as babies, we, we kind of knew, mm-hmm. and I think it, we forgot. And that's my whole thing. Like, if, if you're sitting here doubting what we're talking about as far as like, well, you guys, you know, you were an athlete, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I was uh, like, we had these cool moments. Yeah. If anybody has kids, and remember, you know, my kids really helped us. Like, when I look at my kids, you know, they're playful. They have huge imaginations. They're super creative. Um, they're relentless, Relentless. Mm-hmm. Like when they want something, there's just nothing stops it's them. It's funny that you don't have to teach kids that. 100% closures. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to teach my, them that look. I'm going for it. Right. Again and again and again. My, yeah, my yeah, son, yeah, yeah. they take yeah. risks. My son has closed me 11 years straight. 100% <laughs> closed. Never lost a close. Yeah. Um, they're very forgiving. Yeah. They are, they're loving. Their, their beliefs are easily formed. Mm-hmm. Um, they... Uh, they question limitations like crazy. And the biggest question they ask about everything is why? And it's time to go to bed. Why? Well, and then I have, I have no why to tell them because, uh, well, it's eight o'clock. Why? Like, because I realized, oh my God, look at all these amazing characteristics these kids have. And I'm like, I, I, and I found myself going, I wish I had those. Then I go, I just spent thousands of dollars to go to the seminar. So I was told they were teaching me how to develop these traits, but my kids have them. And then I went through this whole thing. I was like, oh my God. I go, my kids never read a book. I went to a seminar on these things. Nope. And then it hit me in the head. We were all born with them. Mm-hmm. I'm like, holy shit. Mm-hmm. So I was like, so we were always born the hero. So what happened around four, five, six is we got into, we went into the institutionalization of life and in the, in the society. And the kid got, that hero got squeezed into a system. Don't speak out. Because my, right, they were expressive. They'll speak when they want to speak. Sure. They'll dance when they want to dance. So they, they're very secure. Right? Kids weren't as, so insecurity was educated. Mm-hmm. So if you're sitting on the sign and you have any type of insecurities, it was all educated. Mm-hmm. It was never inborn. So when you realize we, we came into this world with all of that and we were actually deconditioned, suppressed, distracted, or even punished. And now today with kids medicated out of it. Right. How about the kid who speaks up in class? Like we're in, we're in a society today that bad grades. When I was growing up, bad grades equaled a stupid bad kid, behaviorally bad kid. Oh yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting there going, oh my god, write that kid off. Yeah. What, what's a grade? What is it? What is a grade? It's this false. Like I don't even know what a grade is. Like it's some type of made up representation, and then actually like coincided with a label to if you were a good person or not. And, I, and you when you really start to pick it apart, it blows your mind going. This is where it happened. And then we start living out other people's values. We put on that false suit or that secret identity to conform and fit in. And then we wonder why in our 20s, 30s, or 40s, we're like, who am I? I don't know who I am. And, and you either drink it out of you, <laughs> you know, have an affair, yeah. um, do these things to distract you. Yeah. Or you face it, and then, uh, like you said, it's like that muscle. It hurts a little bit, but the reward at the other, the reward at the other end, is the only thing that's going to feel happy and true. Yeah, you know, man. You know, um, it's so funny, man. I was reading uh, "Born to Run" by uh, Dr. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Kelly's um, yeah. Scarlett. And so, anyway, he talks about how kids know how to run out the gate. They get up, they're running, they're rolling. Yeah. It's, it's, you don't have to teach them good form. They're on the balls of their feet, you know, like, but. Once they hit a year of school, 
like that first grade, mm-hmm. and they're in the desk, not in kindergarten anymore, like on the cots, running around, playing with toys, and they put them in that desk, and their back starts to have that C-shaped curve. The, the you hip know, flexors get tight. Hip flexors getting tight. They're leading with the heel strike run, and it's like now all of a sudden we don't know what how to do this anymore. But at three and four, up until we get to Boom. six, seven, just rolling. It's time to run. Let's let's get let's go. Every kid knows how to do that, and it's funny that when you look at us as humans, we're building our business, we're in relationships now, and we're trying to do all these things. It's like so many of us are mass produced. Yeah. Right? And nobody's, or very few people are questioning, you know, why, man? What? Why? And yeah. those ki- those people are given drugs. You got ADD. <laughs> you're depressed. You're this, and they're, they're lobotomized chemically. Yeah. And the tough thing where a kid, imagine you have this beautiful artist, you, a beautiful kid who's expressive in questions, and they're given a drug. And every single day that kid takes that drug subconsciously, they're reassuring and reaffirming themselves, there's something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. I'm a bad person. And they literally, it's it's the biggest tragedy of the world, man. Man, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really, man, I'm, I can't tell you how, how grateful I am for your time. I can't tell you how grateful I am the fact that we had, we just vibe the way we did. I yeah. mean, it's, it's rare. I'll be honest with you. I, I try to get with everybody, but it's rare that it hits on this level. And um, I really just hope that it, it, it shook somebody. It, yeah. it shook me a little bit, you know. And, 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 I mean, I feel like I was already doing well, <laughs> you know. But but it's always good to have a next level, right? There's so many levels to this. We don't even know. And it, and hopefully someone listening was able to kind of just kind of say, you know what? I'm going to start questioning things in my life again, mm-hmm. man. I mean, because I think with those questions, they'll lead you down some pathways that will yeah. get you to kind of know yourself. Man, but... um. Two more questions for you. One, you got to tell everybody how to find you, how to, what you're up to. Um, but let's, let's kind of start with that. What's next right, for right. you, man? Uh, where they find me or what's next for me? Let's start with what's next and then where to find you. All right. So, uh, well, we have the I Am Hero Project. That's uh, my course coming out there. So it's a digital, a really fun a digital course that's really beautifully cinematic and everything like that. Short videos. But we're going over these concepts. And we have <laughs> nice. uh, four modules, uh, my Hero Rising module, my Hero Rising methodology that we do. So it's all in there. It's uh, really amazing. And then, you know, I'm just speaking all over the country and the world on these different things. Small group intensives for more small entrepreneurs where it's, it's, a, it's smaller 15, 20 group. We really dig deep in all these things for their business, mind, body, business, and future. And, uh, and, the, and just really blowing up and getting that, uh, that exposure out. So that's, that's the fun. That's, a, that's, I'm just staying fun and having fun with it for sure. So you're just shaking people up all over the country right now. Yeah. The book, <laughs> you know, the, the yeah. book, the book will be out soon, but really for okay. me, cause, um, one of the things we teach is uh, choose your vehicle of influence. That's one of the things. So, like, you're great on podcast and audio. You're an amazing you. interviewer, viewer, and I, I love it. And my vehicle is is uh, video and speaking. So, for that is, you know, nor, uh, naturally, when I went to create content, instead of writing the book or speaking the book. I did video because that was my that was my vehicle. So that's why I tell everybody we find that vehicle to be able to get their message out that they feel fun and happiness. And I'll show you a couple of sneak peeks after we're done here. But um, and so it's just uh, that, that's what we're doing. It's really taking off so fast and so quick. And I have a lot of fun. And it really is waking up people. And that's what I do. Like my purpose is I resurrect heroes out of mm-hmm. the complacency of their secret identity. Watch this. So they can live heroic lives once again. See how that makes sense? Because yeah. we, li- we were born heroic. So yeah. they get, and th- but how do we do that? By expressing and experiencing true love now in every area of our lives. And that's expressing appreciation unconditionally right now. In my finances, no matter how it is right now, in my relationship, you no know, how much she's a, you know bugging me or not, in in my in my business and in my health, because someone right now they're listening and like they might be down on their health, but it's like hey, let's walk to them, like a, do something and appreciate that. That's a win. So if I could express and experience true love now, when we only have the powers now in every area of our life. Then from that place, amazing things could happen. Mm-hmm. See, that just starts to build the foundation to build the life you want to have. Man, that's um, man, that's a needed message, man. Yeah. I mean, because um, a lot of people right now, I mean, it's not that uh, people have always dealt with these issues before during the eighties, nineties. People were trapped on TV, watching TV yeah. shows. Now, those same a lot of us are trapped on Instagram, trapped on you know on like Facebook, YouTube, whatever your whatever your social media drip is, and it's like so we're lost in these time warps, right? Yeah. And we're not present, and, and we're losing that. You know, mm-hmm. one-to-one type of connection, interaction. It's, it's, it's one of those things where I think people need to kind of hear more and more of those messages of, okay, get present in the moment, feel it, right? You know, get with people, feel them in this role from there. 
Uh, and no, nothing but greatness happens, and all the unknowns open up, which which uh, you guys will find uh, in, in in the courses. And, you know, I have stuff for them if they, that they'll be able to find if you're listening. So I'll just tell them about that right now. That's please, easier. please, yeah. yeah. Um, if you go to IamHero.com, so IamHero.com. Um, we have uh, – I have made a couple free master classes for everybody. Uh, the one, depending on when this comes out, it's called the, the Hero the hero Secret Sauce. So if you said, hey, you know, what did you do to win New York State Competition of Piano, win Mr. America, Mr. Universe, uh, build a, a massive clinic, all these things we're doing? There's some key traits, success traits that I distill down for you guys. So that's, uh, that's right there for you. We have another master class called Time Expansion. A lot of people are sitting here saying, well, I just don't have the time to pursue my goals and dreams. I get it. I know that feeling. So instead of like, again, the old theory was time management. You don't manage time, but I teach you how to expand time. Hmm. Like, you know, that we, we, we live in vertical time. We actually expand it so you can have the time to do those things you need. And then another one after that uh, course is called I am value. We're sitting here saying you don't, and you're kind of lacking a little bit of that pride and ego towards what you do. Well, I am value is a course that I made for you guys. They're all 20 video, one month courses where you start to get faith, confidence, and belief in your product, service, and idea. You learn how to communicate that wow. to the customer to have an exchange of higher fees. Ooh. And then one month to win is another one. A lot of people you're listening right now, you feel stuck. But that's all an illusion. You're not. Life is always moving forward and expanding. Mm-hmm. So one month to win is I realize that if my character is based on what I do on a daily basis, our character is not what we do on a one-time basis. It's, it's just a daily basis. So in order for me to have the character of a winner, that I need to be winning on a daily basis. So I go through and I show you how you, – like you guys are listening to this right now. You won. You did your run. You won, right? So when you realize that, you know what? I'm not stuck. I'm winning every day. We start to shift that. And that blows people out of, you know, out of any type of depression or, or empathy or, or, or yeah, um, apathy and indifference. Sure. And then diet hacks, which is a fun one. People are like, hey, you know, how do you keep – you know, it's, I don't tell you how to, it's just like little easy things to be consistent. So when it comes to your health, which is your greatest asset, we cannot do anything in this planet without our physical body. I have little diet hacks in there to stay consistent. That's the key. People are like, what do you, what diet do you like? I'm like, it's not the diet. Like whatever I could do consistent, I win. Yep. And so they're all my gift to you guys, or, or some of them are, are low fee. If you go to imhere.com, you'll be able to see those. And then if you want to keep this conversation going, mm-hmm. Uh, you'll find me on Facebook and on Instagram. A little bit more Instagram now. Since my 80-year-old mom hopped on there, i got to follow her. <laughs> nice. But the cool thing is one, I want everybody to realize this is my value. I put content out every single day, yeah, different which is, content. Which is bananas, yeah. And it's good stuff. It's like yeah. we're talking about today. But my highest value is because I love social interaction. And I believe social media is, is when you comment, I comment back. Like So I answer every one of my comments. I answer all my DMs and uh, because that's a high value of me. So – if you listen to this and you want a direct line to me, comment, DM, we'll keep this conversation going as long as you want. Man, you know what, man? And, and you're, um, you've been awesome, man. Really, Thanks, really man. I mean, like from start to finish, like I reached out to you in DM. That's how we linked up. It was really relaxed, casual. Never spoke prior to that, right? I just kind of watched some of your content. I was like, oh, he's yeah. on to something. And, uh, man, you, you followed through with everything that you said, which is, which is awesome, man. I really um, appreciate you coming, coming on the show and taking this moment. It's been awesome. I cannot wait to put these links into the actual show notes. Please, guys, go check it out because I think it's going to help you guys just keep moving forward day to day to day. Dr. Chris Zeno, man, this has been such a pleasure. And uh, guys, you guys go out and be great. Until next time. Well,